Hello, my name is Baram Jam, and the topic is Explaining Persistent Pain Using Pavlov's Dogs, Part 1 of 2. If you look down the edge of a cliff, your heart may race. If you hear a sudden, unexpected loud noise, you may jump. If you smell fresh flowers, you may feel relaxed and smile. When you taste your cup of coffee, you may feel cozy and warm. When you're hugged by your child, you will feel loved, but if you're touched on the back of the hand by a stranger on the bus, you will feel you're in danger. Our unconscious mind responds to all the stimuli experienced by our senses, even before the conscious mind realizes that anything is going on. The simple fact is that certain sights, sounds, touches, smells and tastes and emotions cause us to feel or behave in very predictable ways. These automatic and predictable responses may be subtle, such as a smile when others' responses are strong, such as muscle tension, anxiety and pain. The goal of this presentation is to explain classical conditioning and the basic concept that a stimulus, S, produces a response, R. The story begins in the 1890s with the famous Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov and his experiments on dogs. A brief review of your Psych 101 course. Pavlov gave the dogs food, they salivated. He rang a bell and gave them food, they salivated. After repeated conditioning, he only rang the bell and didn't give them food and the dogs still salivated. To understand classical conditioning, we must first become familiar with six terms and acronyms. So here we go. Neutral stimuli, NS, neutral response, NR, unconditioned stimuli, UCS, unconditioned response, UCR, conditioned stimuli, CS, and conditioned response, CR. A dog hears a bell, which is an NS, or a neutral stimuli, and this produces no salivation, which is an NR, which is a neutral response. This can be done hundreds of times a day, and still nothing happens. The ringing of the bell is an NS, and nothing happening is an NR. A person moves comfortably, which is an NS, and this produces no fear, tension, or discomfort, which is an NR. This can be done hundreds of times a day, and still nothing happens. Go ahead, stand up, bend forward, and see if anything happens. Hopefully, if you don't have back pain or a history of it, nothing will happen. Or look down with your neck. See if you experience anything. It's a neutral stimuli producing a neutral response, which is nothing, hopefully. Now, in Pavlov's dog situation, the NS is bell ringing, the NR is no salivation. In the human scenario, the NS is a specific movement or activity, and the NR is no pain experience. Now, unconditioned stimuli is the food, and the unconditioned response is salivation in the Pavlov's dog scenario. In the persistent pain scenario, the UCS is actual or potential injury, and the UCR is the pain experience. When a dog is given food, which is a UCS, it produces a natural and physiologically predictable unconditioned response, which is salivation. This unconditioned response is an expected physiological response. When an individual experiences an acute back injury, which is a UCS, it produces a natural and physiologically predictable UCR, which is a pain experience. This unconditioned response is an expected physiological response. So UCS can lead to a UCR. When food is served, which is UCS, at the same time as the ringing of the bell, which is a neutral stimuli, repeatedly over several days, the UCS and the NS become linked together. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And you can see neurons that fire together, the bell and the food, the physiological response is that of salivation. When a back injury occurs, a UCS, at the same time as a specific movement or an activity such as bending forward and NS, repeatedly, the UCS and the NS become linked together. And neurons that fire together, 
wire together again. So the wiring this time was the injury and the specific movement that's associated with that injury. And eventually you get a physiological response, which is that of pain with movement. When a neutral stimuli, NS, such as a bell, is linked to an unconditioned stimuli, such as food, a new conditioned stimuli is artificially born. So an NS plus UCS results in a CS, which means just a bell on its own. CS is the bell ringing, leads to a CR, salivation, even in the absence of food. So as you can see, the bell becomes a CS and through classical conditioning, a CR occurs. CS is a specific pain movement or a specific movement or an activity which leads to a CR, which is the pain experience, even in the absence of actual or potential tissue injury. So this time CS is a movement and the CR is the pain experience. Classical conditioning in Pavlov's dog summarized. The NS is ringing up the bell, there is no food given and the dog does not salivate, a neutral response. Then you give the dog food, which is the UCS, and the dog salivates, which is a natural physiological response, or UCR. Then with repetition, the bell ringing at the same time as the food, the dog salivates, and you get classical conditioning, where there's no food given, and the CS becomes the ringing of the bell, and the CR becomes the dog salivating. A CS bell ringing that was originally an NS in a CR salivating, even in the absence of food. And that is, in a nutshell, classical conditioning. Now there's a concept called generalization, where no food is given, but the conditioned stimuli can be a phone ringing or a doorbell ringing, which somewhat sounds like a bell ringing, and the dog still salivates. Generalization is a tendency for a stimulus, similar to the CS, to elicit a response similar to the CR. Discrimination. If there's a knock on the door and no food is given, the dog doesn't salivate because the dog knows this sounds nothing like a ring, doorbell ringing or a bell ringing, so it says, I'm not going to get food for this. Discrimination is when a human or an animal learns to make a particular response to some stimuli but not to others. It's important to have discrimination response as you would not want to have the same response for all stimuli. Extinction. After a long time when food is no longer given to the, when the bell rings or when, the, when you ring the bell very lightly and repeatedly and no food is given, the dog doesn't salivate. Extinction is when the CS is repeatedly presented without the UCS. And so eventually the CS is no longer able to elicit the CR. The process of extinction is used to treat phobias. Spontaneous resurgence or of SCS occurs for no known reason and is usually not as strong as it was originally. So in spontaneous resurgence, suddenly for no known reason, the conditioned response returns. But no food is given, but perhaps there's a the ring bell really loudly and the dog salivates a little because it always has the unconscious or subconscious memory in the past that the bell ringing was associated with salivation. Now let's talk about classical conditioning in humans with low back pain. So the NS is bending forward, there's no injury, and there's no pain experience, which is an NR, a neutral response. And then eventually in time, you get an actual or potential injury, let's say in the back. And there's a pain experience, which is natural after an injury. With repetition, bending, and the actual or potential injury, the pain and associated with the pain experience, you get classical conditioning. Even when the actual injury is resolved and the tissue is healed, it's been several weeks or several months since the original injury and lots of treatments to treat the tissue. But still, bending or in any movement results in the pain experience. A CS bending that was originally an NS results in a CR, the pain experience, even in the absence of tissue pathology. And that is again classical conditioning. Generalization is when there's no actual or potential injury anymore. However, all movements and activities result in a CR, which is the pain experience. 
whether it's flexion, extension, rotation, sitting, walking, that's generalization. Generalization occurs in order to lower the risk of missing positive alarms, as the nervous system is now in hypervigilant mode, even though this is at the expense of increasing false alarms. Discrimination, where there's, for example, lumbar extension or a novel movement without the presence of an injury, produces no pain experience, a UCR. Discrimination may perhaps explain why sometimes novel movements such as lumbar extensions don't aggravate a low back pain and may even reduce the pain experience, which is a physiological response, just like salivation. Extinction is graded exposure to non-threatening physical movements. When the neutral stimulus is a gentle exposure to non-threatening movements or physical activity, in the absence of a UCS, no actual or potential injury, no pain experience occurs. Extinction is when the CS is repeatedly presented without the UCS, and so eventually the CS is no longer able to elicit the CR. The process of extinction may be used to treat persistent pain related to central sensitization. Spontaneous resurgence, when suddenly for no known reason, the condition response returns. There's no actual or potential injury. However, a new physical movement or an activity, let's say a downward dog in yoga, results in the pain experience again. Spontaneous resurgence of persistent pain related to central sensitization is common as the subconscious memories of the conditioned stimuli never quite fully become extinct. And that is why a variety of ongoing physical activities is required. Literally, Anything that was happening at the time of the original acute pain or that has been happening over the period of experiencing pain can become associated with and trigger the pain experience all by itself. Once again, demonstrating that neurons that fire together, wire together. Such as experiencing neck pain while driving on the same road as where the accident occurred. Experiencing low back pain when sitting on the same couch as where the pain is always felt. Experiencing headaches when dealing with the same work, insurance company, or mother-in-law. That was a joke, by the way. When structural injuries and red flags have been ruled out, should the management of chronic pain focus on eliminating pain? Modern medicine is obsessed with fighting and eliminating pain by using various modalities, creams, massage, manual therapies, and pharmaceutical interventions from over-the-counter painkillers to opioids, which all inevitably fail in centrally sensitized individuals. These interventions are similar to focusing on eliminating the salivation in Pavlov's dogs instead of focusing on the elimination of the classical conditioning that has occurred. We are so often preoccupied with stopping the conditioned response, which is pain, when in fact the primary focus of treatment must be on eliminating the association between the conditioned stimuli and the conditioned response, meaning eliminating the association between movement and pain. How should we manage a dog salivation? Option number one, focus on controlling or eliminating the conditioned stimulus. Ensure that the dog never hears a bell or anything remotely sounding like a bell ever again. That could certainly prove effective in the short term, but the challenge is, can we realistically, permanently, fully stop and control for all sounds that even remotely sound like bells? What if the doorbell rings, or a child on a bicycle rings their bell, or an ice cream truck comes by? Therefore, attempts to permanently stop all bell sounds becomes a very challenging long-term approach. Option number one, focus on controlling or eliminating the conditioned stimulus, meaning all exposure to future bell sounds. It's not a long-term viable option. Option number two, focus on controlling or eliminating the conditioned response. Give the dogs anti-salivation medication or place saliva absorbent devices on the dog's tongue to soak up the saliva when it inevitably occurs, especially before or after the ringing of a bell. But the challenge is, 
even if salivation could be somewhat controlled by the medications, suction devices, or absorbent cloths, the actual link between the bell and the salivation will never be resolved with this approach. Therefore, attempts to stop the salivation becomes a futile long-term approach. How should we manage a dog salivation? Option number two, focus on controlling or eliminating the conditioned response, which is the salivation is not a viable long-term option. Option number three, focus on reducing or eliminating the association between the CS and the CR. That is what is suggested here. But how? Extinction by graded exposure. Frequent graded exposure to ringing of bells without the serving of any food is the ideal method of eliminating the association between bell ringing, CS, and salivation, CR. At first, the ringing of the bell is needed to be so faint where the dog isn't even sure if that was a real bell ringing or not. Extinction doesn't focus on eliminating a natural physiological response, such as salivation. Extinction focuses on eliminating the associated triggers that are responsible for the physiological response. How should we manage, we can change the word dog to a person's, salivation, we can change it to persistent pain. Option number one, focus on controlling or eliminating the conditioned stimuli. Ensure that the person never again moves or does anything remotely physical ever again. That could certainly prove effective in the short term, but the challenge is, can we realistically, permanently, fully control a person's every movement or activity? Therefore, attempts to permanently control all aggravating functional movements becomes a futile long-term approach. How should we manage a person's persistent pain? Option one, focus on controlling or eliminating the conditioned stimuli, meaning all exposure to painful movements. It's not a viable long-term option. Option two, focus on controlling or eliminating the conditioned response. Give the person pain medications or various manual therapies and pain relieving modalities when pain is present, especially before or after the aggravating movements or activities. But the challenge is, even if pain could somewhat be controlled by medications, manual therapies, or modalities, the actual association between the movement and the pain experience will not be resolved with this approach. Therefore, attempts to stop the pain experience becomes a futile long-term approach. Option number two, focus on controlling or eliminating the condition response which is which in this scenario is the pain experience is not a long term viable option for those who have centrally sensitized pain several explanations have been proposed for the development of chronic pain which persists long after tissue healing classical conditioning or associative learning is one of the proposed mechanisms explaining the transition from acute to chronic pain Classical conditioning can modulate judgments about whether an event is painful or not. How should we manage a person's persistent pain? Option three, focus on reducing or eliminating the association between the CS and the CR. And that is what is recommended in this presentation. But how? This is the end of part one of two. In order to build up suspense, the how question will be answered in the part two of this presentation. If you found this information interesting and clinically relevant, you may access the second half of this presentation on apti.ca in the clinical library section. Part two will describe the studies supporting this approach and specific clinical application of these ideas into your direct patient care by reviewing two case studies. However, before we review the various options for reversing classical conditioning, which is the association between movement, activities, and pain, I ask that you visit the Pain Truth website and download the Pain Truth app in order to learn more about the program. I look forward to speaking with you in part two.